Good morning. How's everybody? Well, Happy New Year. Uh, it is the uh, first Sunday of 2024. So, um, you know, used to that was a lot harder to to, um, to remember uh, the, the year when it changed. You know, when you would write a check, you would, but uh, how many of you have written a check um, recently? Not, you know, sometimes you do. Like, I write a check when I get my hair cut, my, my barber. Uh, they're a little old school in that way, so they take cash and check, and that's it. Um, every now and then, they'll take an IOU. If I don't have any cash or I forgot my my check. Um, but, yeah, we used to, we'd, we'd, we'd write the wrong date on the check or whatever, but we really don't do that anymore. Uh, everything's automated, like your phone automatically knows what year it is now. And so every, everything you print when, you, uh, when you're on a, a computer program and you're writing something, it knows the date. Uh, you don't even have to keep up with daylight savings time. Um, I've got a clock by the bed. I wake up in the morning and it's already changed itself and my phone changes itself. Um, it's amazing. But it is 2024. So um, we're looking forward to uh, the year and all of the wonderful things that God has in store for us uh, in our personal lives as well as uh, Grace Communion Hanover. And we wanted to make sure that you all knew, uh, if you're watching us on Facebook, um, on our live stream, that in 2024, you should make an effort to be here. Um, you're going to miss out on a lot of fantastic things uh, if you're not. So we're at 7300 Hanover Green Drive in Old Town Mechanicsville. And uh, we look forward to meeting you in person, face to face. So let's begin with a prayer. Um, Father, Son, and Spirit, you've shared love and life with us. And um, regardless of, of where we count time, or how we count time, or how we mark one year versus another year, and... and um, the, the, the truth of the matter is, Lord, time is something that you gave us so that we could, we could keep track of how we move through the world. Um, there was never a time when you decided to create. Uh, Lord, you made a decision in love to create, and, the, and out of that, you created time. So we appreciate the fact that we are here in this space and time, that you have given us a place in your world. Lord, let us make the most of it. Let us make the most of these days that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're going to be um, talking about uh, the baptism of Jesus. And um, I don't know if you've ever thought about that in, in depth before, um, but let's, let's review. In fact, let's do our memory verse. Um, uh, that's not a New Year's resolution, in case you were wondering. You know, you, you you may be thinking, uh, sitting here, that, oh, he remembered the memory verse. He must have made a New Year's resolution. No, I, I, I actually, I didn't. I just happened to look down and see this note that I have written here, that I've had written here for a year, uh, that reminds me, I, but I don't always remember to look at the note that reminds me to do the memory verse. Uh, but I remembered to look at the note that reminds me to do the memory verse today, so that's why we're doing the memory verse. And, uh, I've threatened to have... Ron in the back, um, Deacon Ron, hold up a sign that says memory verse on it. But anyway, our memory verse is John 1, 29. The next day he, and this is John the Baptist, of course. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. So there's a few things in that that we'll go over um, over today, but let's keep going. If you um, if you have a Bible, or um, maybe you're maybe you're using an electronic version, uh, a lot of us do that now. But if you if you would like to join us in our flagship passage, we're going to be in Matthew chapter four, <clears throat> and. Um, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 13. Um, 
Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? <clears throat> well, that's a good point. Uh, if you've ever thought about the baptism of Jesus in depth, um, it gives you a little bit of cause to scratch your head, right? If, if, if we didn't have an explanation of what's going on here, if Jesus hadn't um, gone into a little bit more detail about it, you might be a little confused. Because who is Jesus? Is he, is he a man? Right? Of course he's a man. Right? He, he did e Jesus did everything that a man does. And when I say man, I don't mean a male. Right? Jesus did everything a human being does. He was born. He learned to walk. He learned to use the restroom by himself. He learned to feed himself. You know, he had to learn coordination, right? How to get that. That's why you don't give babies forks. You teach it, you, they learn on a spoon, right? So that they have two functioning eyeballs after they learn to eat, right? I mean, imagine, you know, you're, you're, you're at somebody's house, they invited you over for supper, and they've got a, a, a one-and-a-half-year-old that's learning to eat, and there's an eye patch on the baby. Well, what's with the eye patch? He's just not good with a fork yet. Well, man, that's why you give him a spoon, right? Give him a spoon, start him off with a spoon. And, uh, of course, I'm kidding, but Jesus had to learn that. Jesus had to learn how to hit his mouth with his hand. And then he had to learn how to do it with a, a utensil of some sort, right? He learned to do everything. He had to learn to crawl. He had to learn to walk. He had to learn to speak the language of his day. Eventually, he had to learn to read and write. Um, well, yeah, but he was, uh, Jesus was God. Well, yeah, Jesus is God. But Jesus is fully human. Is it human to be born with the knowledge of how to do all those things automatically? No, it's not human at all. Jesus' experience in the incarnation was to experience what it means to be human. So he had to learn it. He, no cheat codes, right? For you gamers out there, there's no cheat codes. There's no back, back, up, button, left, trigger. There's no cheat codes. Jesus did it all on the level. He did it all on the level. Well, if he's God, why does he need to be baptized? Oh, because he's also human, and every human needs to be baptized. Is that right? Close. Close. Jesus tells us in the next verse. John the Baptist is going to prevent him. You know, John, John, if you go back and you read in Mark's account and Luke's account, John is talking about Jesus, and he's saying, hey, I'm, I'm baptizing you with water, but there's one coming after me. I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals or untie his sandals, and he's going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. And then this, this person that John is talking about shows up at the Jordan where he's baptizing people with water and says, hey, John, can I get some of that? Let me get some of that water baptism. And, of course, John already knows who Jesus is. John knows he's the Messiah. John knows he's going to, because who is Jesus to John? He's the first cousin. And now you, you'll see pictures of John. I was in a church um, about 25 years ago, and it was a big church, big fancy church. And Davina and I were there. They had a they had a like a Christian music karaoke sort of thing going on on Friday night. So I mean, a lot of times we would we'd go hang out and meet people, and I'd take my guitar. I mean, I don't need I don't need the karaoke music. I can make my own, so I'd take my guitar and. And, um, in fact, we were at that church. They had a Super Bowl party. And I don't know if you remember, 
I can't re I can't recall the exact year, but it was gonna it, it was 2000, 2001, something like that. Do you remember U2 played the halftime show? And you know that U2 has a song called Streets with No Name. It's about heaven. And I don't know if you, I mean, because there's a lot of stupid stuff that goes on in the halftime show at the Super Bowl now. When U2 played the Super Bowl, Bono, who is a dedicated, I don't agree with all of Bono's theology, but whose theology do you agree with totally? You don't even agree with Jesus' theology totally. So you don't know all of that, right? So we can't say we agree with any. But Bono, before he played, before they sang Streets with No Name at the Super Bowl in front of God and everybody, he said into the microphone, do you remember what he said? I'll never forget it. He said, Lord, bless my lips as I bring forth your praise. When's the last time you heard that at the Super Bowl halftime show? Lord, bless my lips as I bring forth your praise. But in the in the hallway, going up, you know, big church, going through to the fellowship hall, they had all these beautiful paintings, all this iconography of of different people, and they had this this painting of John the Baptist. It said on the little brass plaque, John the Baptist, and he looked like he was eighty years old. How do you get that from reading your Bible? John the Baptist died before Jesus died, and he was only six months older than Jesus. Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, was six months pregnant when Mary walked in the room and Jesus leapt for joy. Uh, I'm sorry, John the Baptist leapt for joy in Elizabeth's womb when Mary walked in. Oh, give, me, give me a rational, natural explanation of that one. Well, baby's sick, and you know, she may have had some indigestion, or it might just be that John the Baptist's spirit recognized the spirit of the Messiah. It could also be that the Holy Spirit, hey, guess who that is that just walked in the room? And why would the Holy Spirit do that? So we could have this. Important record. Oh, yes, this is very important because John the Baptist. It might just be that sometimes the news is so good you can't wait to tell somebody just so you can see the smile on their face. Where do you think that comes from? Does that have its origin in you? I think it's important sometimes when we experience things to reflect on where that comes from. When you get so excited about something, you can't wait to tell somebody else because you just know it's going to bring them joy. That has its origin in the heart of the Father, Son, and Spirit. So, John says, hey, cuz, you're really going to come to me for baptism? And what does Jesus say? Let it be so for now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. There you go. Jesus just, just told you why he needed to be baptized. Because God the Father is a legalistic judge and he demands that we be righteous. And the only way for Jesus to be righteous in the presence of the Father is to get wet. Now how did John do it? He was baptizing him in the Jordan. So I guess it's possible that, I mean, they could have just waded in knee deep. You know the old story about the Methodist that was wanted to marry this Baptist girl? And the Methodist father, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, um, it, was a, it was a Baptist that was wanted to marry a Methodist. And um, his daddy said, well, has she been baptized properly? Well, Dad, yeah, she's been baptized. He goes, no, I mean, I mean baptized like we baptized, all the way under. So, well, I don't know about that, but she's been baptized. Well, she's got to be baptized the right way. Well, Dad, she was, they, you know, they sprinkle, they baptize, it's just different. No, she has to be baptized the way. What if she wades in knee deep? No, nope, not good enough. What if she wades in waist deep? Nope, not good enough. Well, how about if she wades in 
you know, all the way up to her neck. Nope, not good enough. He said, well, how about if she wades in until, until just the top of her head is sticking out of the water? Not good enough. And the son said, see, I told you it was that little bit on top that mattered the most. Is that how Jesus was? Why was Jesus baptized to fulfill all righteousness? Is it because God is a judge and that's what God demands? Imagine that. Imagine the eternal, faithful son of the father and, and his father will not receive him or accept him or consider him righteous until he goes into the... What, does, what is Jesus doing in the baptism? You know, in the creed of 325, um, I'll just, I'm just i going to read it really fast. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. That's four lines. Four measly little lines about the Father. There are... I don't want to count them. Twice as many or more about the Son. There's a brief mention of the Holy Spirit at the end. And a an infinitesimally small mention of baptism and the and the universal church. The reason for that is because the, the Nicene Creed of 325 was written to address a specific heresy called Arianism that denied the divinity of Jesus. So that's why there's so much about the Son in the Creed. It's because it was addressing that heresy about Jesus, the eternal Son of the Father. But at the very end, it says, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And the word Catholic there means universal. It doesn't mean that we, we have a pope. Yeah, I, I, that word is misspelled. In, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We acknowledge one baptism. So which? Which one is it? Is it full immersion? Now see, when I, if I baptize you, you're going all the way under. You know why? Because that's the only way God will accept you. I'm kidding. That's a joke. No, if I baptize you, I'm, I'm dunking you all the way under because I believe when you get baptized, that's, that's when you tell Jesus and the world and the Father and the Holy Spirit and everybody around, I'm all in. I'm all in for Jesus. So we're going to act it out. We're going to be all in for Jesus. The creed says we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. Going back in Matthew, John the Baptist consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And the voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, in whom I am well pleased. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. What one baptism is it? It's the baptism of Jesus that the creed speaks of. When we find ourselves buried in the scriptures, which we should frequently, we're called upon as believers to uh, wrestle. Right? What is it? What? What? When, when the Bible tells us that we're, we're, that we're to wrestle these things out, wrestle with the Scripture, it's hearkening back to who? Who wrestled with God? Why, why did Jacob wrestle with God? Was he trying to beat God? Was he trying to win God? Was he, he was trying to get a blessing from God. He was trying to understand God. He was trying to get a blessing from God and understand God so that he could walk with God. That's, a, that's what our wrestling in the Scriptures should be like. I'm going to wrestle with these Scriptures because I'm wrestling with the Word of God. I'm wrestling with Jesus Himself because these are the words that He spoke and inspired to be written. And why am I wrestling? 
because I want to know you, Lord. And I want to know what it's like to walk with you. It's like the little um, four-year-old in, in Sunday school who thought that the Lord's first name was Andy because of the song they sang. Andy walks with me. Andy talks with me. Andy calls me his own. We wrestle so that we can know as we are known. And, and your, your Bible, your, your Holy Scriptures, and I say holy in the sense of relationship, just in the, in the um, just meaning that these Scriptures help us deepen our relationship with Jesus. And if they ever stop doing that, it's time to throw them away. That's the purpose of your Bible, is to aid you in your relational knowledge of Jesus. When we get to a place like this, where we're reading about baptism and righteousness and forgiveness and all these concepts, the first question that we should ask is who is Jesus? And, it, and it's usually not just one answer. What I typically do when I'm when I'm when I'm um, studying and I get to a place like this and I want okay let's dig in a little deeper. First thing I'm going to do on a piece of paper is I'm going to write who is Jesus and I'm going to make a list because it will be a list. And the first thing always on my list is he's the eternal Son of the Father. That's the most important thing you can say about Jesus. He is the eternal Son of the Father because it. That's the most critical thing for us about Jesus because Jesus comes into our existence, comes into our world, and He's not coming by Himself. He's bringing His Father and the Holy Spirit with Him because they mutually indwell one another. And He isn't just bringing them with Him, hidden, secretly. He comes to reveal the Father. He comes to the... the the word that John uses, he says that the word has explained him. The word there is exegeomai. It's where we get the word exegete. It means to draw out of, to explain. Jesus is the eternal Son of the Father. He knows the Father in face-to-face -face relationship. I mean, it had to be Jesus that became a human being. Who else knows the Father as a son in face-to-face -face communion? No other person in the cosmos. And he doesn't just come as the son, he comes as God the Son. So that's going to be on my list. He's the eternal Son of the Father. He is God with God, light from light, true God from true God. That's in the creed. And then usually the very next thing on my list is he is the vicarious human being. Do you remember what vicarious means? He's, he's the representative human being. And um, he, is, he is not God in place of you. He's not uh, the vicarious man in place of you, but he is man as you for you, as your representative. You are never lost. You are never lost. You are never swallowed up. You never disappear. I'm looking for a note that I made. Um, it was in a conversation that I had with someone. Um, Norman P. Grubb. I just finished a book by Norman P. Grubb. Um, it's a book called Yes, I Am. It's a good book. Um, I think it was written in 1980. Uh, it's, it's a good book. Uh, it is. But, but, but again, you know, like I said earlier, you know, sometimes we don't agree with a person's theology completely. And the issue is Norman P. Grubb understands at least, and, and look, I don't know if, if he's alive today, what he thinks today. Because most authors will tell you, hey, the stuff I wrote 30 years ago, I've graduated on from that. 
And I, I think that's a healthy thing. You know, people that we, that we appreciate, that we trust, um, will tell you the same thing. Yeah, I've, I've, my faith has matured. Go read through Paul, the Apostle Paul, chronologically. Go, go read his letters in chronological order that he wrote them, and you will see a maturation of his theology and his understanding of who God is. Um, Norman T. Grubb, in this book, he's, 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 he's grasping the concept of union, that, that God has brought humanity into union with himself in the incarnation, but, but he slipped. The, the, the concept of, of distinction sort of slips out of his grasp. He can't, he can't maintain his grip on distinction. In other words, yes, you've been brought into union with God. Yes, Jesus is the vicarious man, but you are still you. God made you, Kate, a distinct person in the cosmos. He gave you your skin color and your hair color and your, your, your warm personality and and the, the food that you like and the food that you don't like. Those, these are all, God made us distinct individuals and you never lose that in your union with the Father, Son, and Spirit. So, Jesus as the vicarious man is baptized. Why? To fulfill all right. If Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of the Father, if Jesus Christ is the vicarious human being and he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, then how could you ever doubt that you are righteous before God? And righteous just by way of review simply refers to right relationship you have been brought into right relationship with God the Father not because of anything that you did not because of any prayer that you prayed not because of your repentance or your adherence to law, even old covenant law, you are made righteous in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The cross is just the punctuation. The cross is the finality. The cross is the final death of death. The cross is the elimination of the fall. So much so that when Jesus makes his final declaration from the cross, there are seven. If you wanted to go look them up. His final declaration is simply, it is finished. Not I'm finished. It is finished. The work is finished. The goal of atoning for humanity, bringing humanity into union with the Godhead, destroying death, putting away everything that seems to separate us from God, the reconciliation of all things back to God. It is finished. So as we pass the element, we should be reminded, we should be reminded that there is an experience, there is an experience available to us in the communion an experience of the life that Jesus shares in the presence of his Father and has from all eternity. And the reciprocating love of the Father toward the Son in the communion of the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes we think of Jesus as the party animal. 
And, um, you know, his father is that strict disciplinarian that, um, you know, don't don't be too loud. Don't be don't make too much noise in the house. You know, don't don't go in that that room. You know, I don't know if you had a room like that in your house. You know, you weren't allowed to go in there because that's where you entertain company if somebody stopped by. And we didn't have a room like that. Our house wasn't big enough uh, for a room like that. But um, I mean, we lived in uh, in every every part of our house all the time. Sometimes we think that's what God the Father is like. But Jesus tells us, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So either Jesus is a frumpy old man, or God the Father is a party animal too. And I really believe that God the Father is as much a party animal as Jesus. And please don't be offended when I call God the Father a party animal. If that's offensive, it's just because we don't know what a good party is. But God the Father knows. Jesus knows. The Holy Spirit knows. So maybe that's a prayer that we can pray. In this, Lord, your body and blood, teach us what it means to really pray. Well, if you, um, if you would like to contribute uh, in some way uh, toward what we are doing here, you can visit our website, gchanover.org. You can text a gift uh, to 804-409-0445. And, of course, there are envelopes in the back. We would love to meet you, uh, to see you here in person. And uh, until next Sunday, um, God bless you.